uh, Dr. Bill Jackson, uh, who comes to us from the University of Maryland in Baltimore, and he's going to talk about uh, what I have found to be some very compelling new work uh, about possible mechanisms of uh, how paralysis is happening in AFM. Um, so with that, let's see, it looks like you had your, it was working at one point, and then now we're back to looking at the slides. Uh, I'm having trouble finding my controls to unmute. I apologize. Oh, you oh, you had been okay. unmuted. I have, to, there you I go. have to unmute before I share. Excuse me okay. for that. Okay. okay. All good. That was the problem. Okay. Back to this. Okay. Well, All right, thanks for the introduction. Take it away. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Sorry about that. I um I first of all want to thank Carlos and Matt for the invitation. It's a real honor to be able to talk to this group and um I'm really happy to tell you about um, our work on, I've lost my title, there we go, uh, the Mechanisms of Paralysis in AFM, and, and uh, Matt had written a new understanding, and I think I've changed it slightly to a new hypothesis, just to emphasize that we're really sort of working on what we think is going on, but we don't entirely know yet, and, and we have some ideas based on our cell biology work. So I'm first going to um, thank everyone for introducing us to the coronaviruses, but I want to emphasize that they're involved with a really wide variety of diseases. Um, everything from the common cold and the rhinoviruses to things that we see in um, like hepatitis virus, one of the hepatitis viruses and, and encephalitis and gastroenteritis. But of course, we're here because we're all interested in their role in both non-polio and polio type paralyses. And so we're looking at these viruses and thinking, well, they're involved with such a variety of diseases, they must be radically different from one another. And in fact, they're not. This is um, some space filling models of coronavirus capsids. And we find that they're actually remarkably similar to one another. They all have what we call this five-fold symmetry of, of uh, axis of symmetry, where you can see in this pentagon shape, which you see sort of throughout all the different coronaviruses. And on the top row here are ones that are thought to be associated with neuro disease. And on the bottom are ones that maybe are not thought to be, and we really can't tell them apart. I sometimes like to tease the medical students when I teach this and say, obviously you can see the difference between the top row viruses and the bottom row viruses. And I wait to see how many of them I can get to nod along until I tell them there is no difference. We don't know, we don't know why some of these are neural, uh, affect neural uh, processes and some of them do not. Um, I also want to tell you that their genomes are remarkably similar to each other. I would first uh, point out to the, you that they're very small genomes. They're in the 7,500 nucleotide range, and those are really, um, that's about two human genes. So they're not very large at all. And um, when we look at their homology, this bar here, the higher the bar, the more similar they are. And you can see a lot of the time, they're almost exactly similar. And this, uh, these black bars here sort of indicate where there's general um, homology or general conservation, you can see there are very few gaps in the bars. So when we look at these four different viruses, many of them have been at least associated with acute flaccid myelitis. We find that they're actually remarkably similar viruses, even though they may have differences in ideology or, or um, outcome. And I'm going to tell you that viruses are remarkable cell biologists. They're very good at infecting cells and changing them. And what we have here is some pictures of cells that have been infected with these viruses. An ordinary cell has this sort of, you know, plain looking cytoplasm. It's sort of open and free. And what happens when you infect these cells with these viruses is you get a group of vesicles. Now, this is a picture that was taken in 1965 of a polio infected cell. And you can see these weird sort of vesicles that sometimes look like horseshoes and sometimes look like double like bagels or donuts. And we see that those, those kinds of vesicles in rhinovirus infected cells, polyvirus infected cells, and here in enterovirus B68 infected cells. And you can see here, again, an infected cell that doesn't have sort of any of these vesicles is a mock infected cell. And when we infect, it fills with these vesicles. And these double membrane structures are known as autophagosomes. And they're observed during infection with most coronaviruses we've tested so far. So the virus is radically changing the in, in interior structure of the virus. And the question is why? And so this process known as autophagy, um, where we see these double membrane vesicles is literally a process we call self-eating where cells digest themselves. So this is how cells sort of 
turn over their internal organelles and maintain homeostasis. They get rid of proteins that have gone bad. They get rid of organelles like mitochondria that are spent. It's critical during organismal development and stress response. And it's also been associated with multiple diseases, including neurodegenerative disease, digestive diseases, cancer, and it's known to be both an anti and pro-microbial. Now this process is basically these vesicles that form, they're first seen as little horseshoe crescents, but they eventually become double membrane autophagosomes capturing cytosolic content. And that cytosolic content is then delivered to the lysosome for degradation and recycling. So imagine this is the giant recycling center of your cell. Okay, so it turns out the virus turns this process on and benefits from it because when we restrict this process by knocking down a critical autophagy gene, here you can see both poliovirus and enterovirus lose somewhere between um, three, you know, a log or um, three to four fold virus uh, when we get rid of this process. So the virus actually is promoted by the presence of these autophagic vesicles, which we found very strange because why would the virus want something that would seem pretty adept at scooping up virus and degrading it? And what we turned out in, in uh, work I don't have time to talk about, but is published, is that the autophagosome is where non-infectious viruses, which we call provirions, mature to become infectious virions. And so inside those autophagosomes, they actually undergo this cleavage maturation of one of the capsid proteins to become infectious. And so that seems to be the role of the autophagosome for these viruses. And, and that's at least solved the problem of why they are inducing this process that it's not obvious why it would be good for the virus. But there is a problem uh, with having virus in the autophagosome. And that is, as I told you, the autophagosome leads to degradation. And so if like me, you have young children, you've probably seen the Toy Story movies way too many times. And I realized and um, about the 11th or 12th viewing of Toy Story 3, that what happens to the toys at the end of that film is they're being dragged toward this incinerator is very much like what's happening to the virus in the autophagosome. They're being sort of inexorably drawn into this degradative vesicle. So why would they choose this dangerous path as a place in which to mature? So the question, of course, is why are they in this place where they could go to a fiery degradative death? So what we started to look at was we looked at, well, how does the autophagosome fuse with the lysosome and deliver those contents? And it turns out it's regulated by a series of proteins that are known as snare proteins. And snare proteins are involved in membrane fusion events. So the three specific snare proteins that are involved in fusing these autophagosomes to lysosomes are called syntaxin 17, that's on the autophagosome, VAMP8, which is on the lysosome, and then we have um, SNAP29, which is cytosolid. And if those three proteins come together, you get a fusion and the autophagosome L, uh, contents are delivered to the autolysosome. This is what those snare proteins look like, just so you can see it if you're interested in structures. And again, when these three proteins, the red, the blue, and the green come together, you actually get that fusion event. Now, the green in this case would be SNAP29, the one that's sort of cytosolic and free, and the other two would be on membranes directly. So the first thing we found was that while we look at SNAP29 during an infection by EBD68, the protein seemed to be going away. And that was a little surprising. It seemed like it was just disappearing. When we looked a little more closely and we did longer exposures, we could actually find cleavage products of this protein as if it was being cleaved and then degraded. And we have uh, antibodies to both the NNC terminus, so we could sort of map where this cleavage was based on the size of the transient cleavage products that we could detect as the protein was being degraded. And we suspected that there might be cleavage by a protease called 3C because our crude mapping with the antibodies led us to these two possible sites of 3C cleavage. Now, 3C is one of the two viral uh, proteases, and it's uh, often responsible for cleaving um, cytosolic proteins. So we did many things. I'm only going to show you one experiment here where we expressed the 3C protein in cells, and we could recapitulate that cleavage of SNAP29. So what that told us was that SNAP29 is being cut in half. And what that does is it prevents the fusion event so that instead of going to that fiery death, the virus is able to escape the cell and, and disseminate. And so this is how the virus is able to survive in a, in a pathway which should lead to, lead to the virus's degradation. 
So SNAP29 cleavage is very important to this virus. It's, it's essential for normal viral replication. So that means the toys get to survive. But you might be asking, thanks for the story, but what does any of this have to do with paralysis disease? And it's a great question. Um, of course, we're all interested in acute flaccid paralysis in, in terms of this non-polio disease that, that has been such a concern over the last decade. And one thing I was thinking about, and I had a colleague who used to work on this, is um, botulism. And botulism is, of course, one of the classic flaccid paralyses. So um, I was thinking about what happens in, in botulism. It's been very well characterized over the last several years. And in order to tell you about this, I'm going to have to tell you about the rest of the SNAP proteins that are known. So I told you about SNAP29. That's involved in this autophagy process. Okay. I'm going to tell you that there's a protein called SNAP23, which is a plasma membrane. We do have a big project on it, but I have no time to tell you today. And SNAP47, which is sort of an orphan that nobody knows about. We're also working on that. But I'm going to focus here on SNAP25. And the reason I'm going to focus on this is that it's specific to neuronal cells. So SNAP25 is thought to be essentially a chromosomal duplication of SNAP23. They're very, very similar overall with only a few changes. But SNAP25 is really only expressed in neuronal cells. And that got me thinking, well, what happens when we uh, put the virus into neuronal cells? And what's happening with this SNAP protein that's not present in many of the cell types we test, like lung cells or gut cells? So this neuronal snare complex, uh, including SNAP25, is very important for neuronal function because it regulates acetylcholine release at the, at the synapse of the virus. So again, when these three proteins come together, very similar to what I told you about SNAP29, when they come together, that mediates the release of acetylcholine at the, at the neuronal synapse. So these three proteins are very homologous to the proteins I told you about in SNAP29, and that's what allows um, this neurotransmitter to be released. And when the neurotransmitter is released to the next neuron, that's one of the main ways that neurons signal to one another. So if you were to inhibit this process, you would strongly inhibit neuronal function. So we know that their neuronal snare complex, this particular one, is targeted by botulism toxins to cause flaccid paralysis. And many serotypes of botulism toxins have been tested over the years. And it's found that many of them um, target different members of this complex, but they all seem to target members of this complex. But A, B, C, D, E, F, the specific targeting is different, but that's how these botulism toxins seem to function. Now, in order to do these experiments, we needed a model neuron for infection, and that's pretty difficult because a lot of people will use rat or mouse neurons, but we can't do that because we have a human uh, virus. So we wanted a neuron model that was relatively inexpensive, renewable, consistent, something we could use for molecular genetic experiments, and something that very important to us was infectable. So what we settled on was a cell called the SHSY5Y. It's a neuroblastoma. It was originally from a cancer. And when you get these from the ATCC and bring them out of the tube, they don't look very much like neurons at all. They look kind of like HeLa cells. But when you put them through a differentiation protocol that involves four different media changes, uh, neural promoting factors, et cetera, I'm happy to send it to anyone who's interested. They start to look very much like neurons. And this is them at the end of the differentiation. More importantly, the SNAP25 protein, which isn't really at the plasma membrane when we look at the undifferentiated cells, now is expressed throughout those axonal processes. We also find um, neural-specific markers like the dopamine receptor and uh, neuromodulin are expressed only after the differentiation. So we're satisfied that at least these cells are taking on a neuron-like fate. We also found that they're very infectable by um, multiple picornaviruses, EVD68 polio and a couple of rhinoviruses. Well, over 24 hours, we get two to three log increase in viral titer, and we can look and see RNA replication when we use a, an antibody against uh, RNA replication complexes, double-stranded RNA. So they're infectable, and they seem like neurons. So what can we learn from them? Well, the first thing we found was that when we infect with EBD68, it, in, it inhibits neuronal function. And we used as a readout for this acetylcholine esterase, which is uh, not directly looking at acetylcholine release, but it's looking at a, a feedback process loop of, of, that, of that same uh, molecule. 
And what we found was EVD68 strongly and quickly inhibits acetylcholine esterase and keeps it down throughout eight hours of infection. It actually goes a little bit lower within, you know, within limits. When we infected with Rhino14, which is not thought to affect, uh, to affect neuron function at all, we actually did see a drop in acetylcholine esterase production, but it starts to recover by the end of the infection, which is interesting. So the characterization between UVD68 and Rhino14 was very different. Um, we obtained a really cool uh, way to look at SNAP uh, activity, which is a CFP and YFP uh, fused version of SNAP25. All you need to know about this is that if it's not in a complex with the other snares, it's going to be cyan or blue. And when it is in a nice folded complex with other snares, it's going to be yellow. So yellow is folded and blue is not. And when we put this into these neuronal cells, we saw that it was yellow, it was folding just fine and it looked normal. When we infected these cells, they turned blue. We can actually still see yellow in some of the axonal processes, but the vast majority of the uh, protein and, and in many of the axonal processes you see here has turned blue, indicating that the normal snare complex is being disrupted by the virus. That was very exciting, but we don't know what this disruption means yet. We looked closely at the SNAP25 protein in particular, and we found a cleavage product. We found that it seems to be cleaved during EVD68 infection and then starts to go away. Possibly the cleavage products are being degraded or something. So that's exciting because that indicates that this has some similarities to what's going on with botulism. Uh, finally, the EVD68 3C protease, which we believed was going to target this because that's what targets SNAP29. We added this protease to, um, uh, this is again purified protease added to purified SNAP25, and we can recapitulate that exact cleavage event. When we use the Rhino14 3C, which is convert, conven uh, commercially available conveniently, um, we don't see any cleavage. So it would seem that this is a specific event of EVD68 3C and does not happen with Rhino14, which of course is not seen to be involved in paralysis events. So this is something that seems to be specific to EVD68. We also overexpressed a SNAP25 version of, or GFP fused version of SNAP25, and we can recapitulate that cleavage even in something that's being overexpressed and we're just detecting with GFP. So we can show that it's, it can happen in an exogenously expressed, we can happen in purified proteins. This seems to be a real cleavage event. We also found evidence for a similar cleavage of another member of this complex, syntaxin 1A which we see a cleavage product. Uh, that cleavage product, which we're working on details right now, would indicate that at least two members of this complex may be cleaved during EVD68 infection. Um, so we know what, where the potential sites are, very similar to what we, I showed you with SNAP29. We think these are being cleaved. We're right now working out the details that they are in fact being cleaved. The third member of the complex, which is called VAMP2, doesn't seem affected. So it was only seems to be cleaving SNAP25 and syntaxin. Um, that would put EVD68 3C protease into the same category as BOTC. BOTC targets SNAP25 and syntaxin, but does not target VAMP. And BOTC is a very efficient um, um, mediator of a flaccid paralysis. So that means that we could have a mechanistic link between what we think are very different causes of paralysis, uh, the botulism kind of paralysis and the acute flaccid paralysis caused by EVD68. So this would give us an idea of one of the therapeutic targets that we might be looking at. In summary, I want to tell you that the virus um, is stealing a degradative process called autophagy to promote virion maturation and that the viral protease 3C needs to cleave the SNAP29 protein to prevent the autophagosome from degrading the virus. Um, in neurons, this same viral protease cleaves the SNAP25 protein, which is actually important for uh, neuronal function. And we think this cleavage might be collateral damage. We think the virus may have evolved to target SNAP29, and it's incidentally targeting SNAP25 when it does find itself in a neuron. And finding itself in a neuron is likely a rare event. This virus probably spends most of its time in the airway epithelia and CNS uh, crossover is not its typical lifestyle. Um, I just want to acknowledge Mike Wagner did a lot of the work I just talked about. He's just starting his graduate uh, career. He's actually in orientation right now for his first year of graduate school. And a lot of the work that I told you about that was older and published was done by two graduate students in the lab, Alexia Richards 
and Abby McGillivray. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, Bill, thanks again uh, for that talk. I it was only a couple months ago I saw it the first time and it kind of blew me away this thought uh, because I will tell you as a pediatric infectious disease doctor, uh, I'll see patients with AFM and I'll see infants with botulism. And it had not occurred to me. And just, you know, when you present it this way, it's like, duh, you know, wow, crazy stuff. So um, we have questions pouring in. So I'll, all right, I'll get right to it. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, are there any protease inhibitors that are known to inhibit the 3C protease of D68 that could potentially be used off-label as an antiviral therapeutic? Yeah, there aren't, there aren't really any that are in use um, clinically, but we're, we're looking forward to ones that we think might, we might be able to put into use. Matt, do you know if there are any, I don't think there are any that have been approved, but yeah, um, so. we're actually looking at, um, we're, we're working with some uh, biochemists who have libraries of things and we're working with, you know, people who do these kinds of modeling of, of the protease. People, we're not the first people to look at, you know, protease inhibitors, but we have this very particular readout that we want to, that we want to look at, and that gives us a little bit of an advantage. It's a okay. great question, but we're just not there yet. All right. Next question. Uh, is the disruption of SNAP25 viral dose dependent? In other words, are different amounts of virus equal different amounts of disruption, uh, leading to less or more severe paralysis? Or yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I don't, I don't really have data to directly speak to that. Um, we we don't we don't think that all of the SNAP25 is immediately cleaved, but by the nature of the fact that it's sort of separating those snare domains, it's probably acting as a poison pill so that a little bit of cleavage can actually disrupt binding of a lot of the wild type complex. So um, I don't know that it needs to cleave a ton of it. I would suspect that if we did a uh, sort of an MOI curve, we would see some differences. We're, we're just started talking about working with um, people who have a lot of current clinical isolates to see if there are differences in the, in the cleavage of SNAP25, and we're getting those clinical isolates now. Cool. All right, next up, Terry Fei Ng asks, does other EVs, so let's say Enervars A71, have 3C activity that cleaves SNAPs, which I think you may have yeah. touched on. Yeah. We don't know about 71. I, I, you know, I have permission to work with 71, but we just haven't started working with it in the lab. <laughs> um, I can tell you that polio and Coxsackie virus, B3, do, those three Cs do cleave the SNAPs. And we've looked at other um, rhinoviruses in particular, and they do not. So it seems so far it's delineated among possibly involved with AFM, seems to cleave SNAP25, probably not involved in AFM, doesn't. But again, you know, we don't have a very large end. So, you know, so far, so good. But um, that's the, that's our hypothesis. All right. Uh, Yossi Depla asks, or says, very interesting talk. Could there be a benefit in cleaving SNAP25 for Enervars D68? Yeah, you know, we've looked, um, not much. Uh, there's very little advantage. And I skipped over those data, but we have knocked it out and knocked it down. And, you know, there seems to be a slight uh, increase in release of virions when we knock it down, but it's not enormous. So again, that's where we sort of come down on this. It's collateral damage. SNAP29 is very important, and it just happens to cleave a protein that looks like SNAP29 when it finds itself in a neuron. Okay. Ian Taylor's next question, what is it about the autophagosome that enables viral maturation? Uh, yeah, that's my other talk. <laughs> that's the one I didn't give today. It's um, it's actually the acidification of the vesicle. So what happens is the autophagosome becomes acidic and that acidic environment seems to promote the, the maturation. And the maturation, I should tell you, is a completely misunderstood or, or, or not understood process. We don't know how the cleavage happens, what the protease is. Um, it's something I'm constantly trying to sell new members of the lab on solving and I haven't gotten any takers yet. It's, uh, it's a big mystery. Gotcha. All right. Uh, two more questions from anonymous attendees. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Have you measured the F, uh, efficiency of the SNAP cleavage with C three C proteases from different strains of? DC? Yeah, we haven't. We we. This is what we're talking about doing now. I should mention that everything here was done with the Fermont strain, and I know the Fermont strain is okay. controversial. We um we have made the Fermont strain ourselves from a cDNA clone that is based on the sequence, the original sequence, and we do not propagate it in the lab. So um, we are, um, you know, we're, we're working with what it says in, in GenBank, whether that's 
already been a little bit culture adapted, we can talk about, but um, we're right now talking about, okay, we have to start looking at other strains. That's important. So that's what we're doing. All right. Uh, and then I'm going to have to cut us off at this last question. There's a lot more. So uh, again, people stick around and maybe Bill can type in some answers as well. Um, and so actually, I'll let you type these two answers. Uh, our previous speaker, Emma Hotcroft, had a question for you. Uh, fantastic and really interesting talk. Is there any indication that 3C has changed over time in conjunction with the sort of like pre and post AFM era, you know? That's what we are excited to find out. We don't know. We don't know if we're going to find that the modern strains are more efficient at cleaving this. Frank, and again, I hope somebody corrects me. And Kevin McKnight is on here, which is great because he knows more about this stuff he, than he I He actually forgot. asked a question. So he's, yeah, got, one for, he's got one for you in the but chat. I will, say, I will say this. I'm not aware of any circumstance, and Kevin may correct me, where anyone has found that one picornaviral 3C cleaves a target and another picornaviral 3C has no effect on that same target. I don't know of any example of that yet. I hope that, I mean, I, it would be great if we were the first, but it's not typical to find these. Usually once someone sees 3C cleave something, you know, we move um, and say, well, it's gonna, you know, all the 3Cs are gonna cleave it. So thank you for that. And maybe Kevin will chime in in the, in the Q and A or the chat. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, thanks Bill. That generated a lot of uh, discussion there, so. Um